Welcome back. How was spring break? Yeah? Is spring break worth it, or would you rather just get semester over a week earlier and not have the haste? Um, this is Geography 10, lecture 13. I have skipped ahead in the PowerPoint presentation to slide number 12. Um, I wanted to put these questions up here to get us started talking about the movie that we watched just before break. Um, any of you who didn't pick up your midterm exams after class last time, um, they will be returned to you in sections this week. If you need them or want them sooner than that, you should talk to your GSI before section. I don't believe they're here right now this minute, correct, the other exams? All right, David has the ones for David and Jessica's sections with him. Um, what do you think of the movie? We've got some questions up here. What are the links between the coffee producers in Ethiopia and the coffee consumers in the US, Europe, etc.? What are the effects of those links to the producers? What position are the producers in vis-a-vis -vis merchants, processors, and consumers? What can we learn about capitalism and globalization from this case? Um, any of you think about the movie during break? Have any specific encounters during break that made you think about the movie? Yes? Who said yes? Nobody wants to talk? Were you familiar with this kind of thing before? Sort of? Did it make you feel differently about the next latte? Your next latte? All right, well, obviously you're not going to talk to me, so I'm going to ask you to talk to your neighbors. Um, I'm going to give you about five minutes, because this is all part of like remembering what it is to be in class again after a week away, um, <clears throat> and perhaps try to remember the movie after whatever it's been now, 12 days or something since we uh, watched it, um, and, and remember how to talk, which apparently has been lost on, at least for some of you, um, in this context, over the break. So for five minutes, I'd like you to talk to three or four people in your neighborhood, right there, your vicinity, around your, your seat, um, and try to remember what, what was in the movie, and try to think of some answers to these questions, and hopefully that will get our blood flowing and our brains working again after what I'm sure was a, a highly edifying spring break, okay? All right, go. Okay, is that better? Who's got an answer to question number one? Or if you want, you can just share your reactions about the movie, your thoughts. Did you enjoy it? Good, we got one person down here who's remembered how to talk. Brilliant. What are the links between coffee producers in Ethiopia and the coffee consumers in the US and Europe? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Coffee is something we're used to having pretty much every day, or at least it's available to us every day, and it's so available as to be sort of unremarkable or normal, and yet it's actually produced in places way far away by people that we aren't likely to ever see. And the demand that we have, that we can, that we can exert through our purchases, um, is extraordinarily powerful, it's, you know, collectively at least. It has the power to organize all kinds of people in these very complicated markets of uh, wholesale distribution and processing and um, elaborate ways of producing it. Um, it's nice that we get you know, the, the really finest Java jerks, or whatever you want to call them, baristas, uh, in the world to help us enjoy just how perfect our lattes are. Um, what about that power of the consumer? Do you feel like that was sort of the message that the movie ultimately delivered to us, that we as consumers have the power and perhaps even the responsibility to try to do something about this? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. A 
third grade lesson on third grade chocolate. Multimedia, yeah. Is there such a thing as third grade Reese's? So they, they actually threw candy away? Wow. So the, the, the household where that little girl just went home and told, him, told her parents to stop buying other chocolate. Do um, you think that had an effect on world chocolate market? No, OK. OK, that one party, that one family can't have that big of an effect. But if everyone were to do that, do you think that's possible? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. OK, yeah. OK. So. OK, that, that's an interesting parallel to draw between this, um, the third grade classroom in Oakland, and anti-apartheid mobilizations in the 80s and 90s. Um, I, mean, I can think of one important difference in the sense that the anti-apartheid movement did not ask just individual consumers to boycott products from South Africa. It actually asked and demanded governments and institutional investors not to invest in South Africa. It actually spoke to a level of organization that's considerably higher than individual consumers making purchasing decisions, right? They actually managed to get entire governments and large investment firms to divest. I mean, that was the, yeah. Okay, yeah. It required a lot of consciousness raising among, among ordinary people. Um, yeah? Okay, you don't, you don't think it's possible because there's always going to be some people who are going to respond more just to the cheapest prices, and they're not necessarily going to be willing to pay more for something like fair trade or something that's somehow done differently. Any other thoughts about that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the links, I mean, getting to the question here, the links are very complicated. The links, obviously, it's easy for us to say, okay, well, this is coffee, and somebody grew it, and now I'm drinking it, so there's a link there. But those links are actually not just buyers and sellers of coffee, but also governments and international or transnational multinational organizations like the World Trade Organization that set the terms or the framework within which international trade occurs, right? And you can also imagine that there are um, national governments, even local governments, who've got certain responsibilities to, for instance, regulate the conditions under which coffee is grown, or workers on coffee plantations are treated, or the conditions of the factories where coffee is processed. And there are lots and lots and lots of people and different levels of both markets and governments involved in this. And we're going to look in a moment a little bit further at this in the case of coffee. Um, there's a long history there of complex efforts to alter, manage that network or framework um, of both government and market exchange in such a way as to try to, what, manage, ameliorate, stabilize swings in the coffee market. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Any other thoughts? Would it, be, would it be fair for the city of Berkeley to ban non-fair trade coffee from the city of Berkeley? Or would that be unfairly imposing on or, con or constraining the choice, the freedom of choice of people buying coffee who might feel like it's entirely their prerogative to buy, what do you call non-fair trade coffee? Cheap. <laughs> unfair coffee? Unfair trade coffee? Maybe calling it unfair coffee would make a difference. Unfair cheap coffee. I'd like an unfair cheap latte, please. Um, <clears throat> what about those coffee growers in Ethiopia? What did it say? The, what, per, what portion of the $3 that you pay for a latte ends up in the pockets of a coffee grower? It, it was written on the back of the box for the DVD, which is why it's easy for me to remember. Um, I think it was at 3 cents. So 1% of the purchase price of a latte. Um, is that unusual for agricultural producers? Any idea? What percentage of the money that we spend on food in this country goes to farmers or food producers themselves? Anybody know? Anybody want to guess? 1%? It's actually, I think it's more like 7. Uh, I think 30 years ago or something, it was closer to 15%. Um, if you go back 50 or 60 years, it was up around 30 or 40%. It's down to... And depending on the sector, and depending on what exactly you're talking about as far as which kind of food, it's somewhere in the ballpark of 7, 8, 9, 10 percent, something like that. Does that strike you as fair? Any thoughts? Where does most of that money end up? In the hands of which link in the whole chain from growing food to consuming it? Yeah. The processing. The processing, the packaging, takes up a much larger portion of it. And then there's, of course, just markups along the way for middlemen. But the processing is the biggest, is the biggest part now. Um, all right, should we, uh, any other thoughts about the movie? We are going to talk more about coffee here, and then we're going to talk about capitalism. Um, let me go back to the first slide here. We're going to talk about speculation. We've already sort of talked about the movie, but I will come back to coffee for a moment. And then we're going to take up this question, what is capitalism, which we began two weeks ago in the first lecture um, about Weber. But this time we're going to talk about it. We're going to ask how Karl Marx conceptualizes this question of what is capitalism and try to relate that or try to use coffee as a way of illustrating some of his arguments. There is a math quiz next week on Sub-Saharan Africa. I posted the map and the list of items for that quiz to vSpace yesterday morning. The readings for today are the sections from Marx that are in your reader. For Thursday, I'd like you to read um, George Orwell's famous essay, Shooting an Elephant, um, a short and I think very engaging reading. For next Tuesday, chapter two of Delaney. And also, along the way, pages 42 to 69 in the Atlas. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Um, just to recapitulate quickly from Weber, describing the evolution of capitalism or the stages, what he took to be the necessary components in the emergence of capitalism. 
he, just, he, he defines it, as we said before, as the production of goods, the provision of goods through industrial rational means um, for sale. So the commercialization of the production and provision of goods and the industrialization as well, but that it emerges from mercantilism. We've talked about this already from Bernstein. He emphasizes the necessity of there being paper representations of ownership in enterprise. So stocks, for example, bonds, um, ways of trading those shares of ownership. It also extends to paper representations of rights to income. So state bonds, not just corporate bonds. Um, mortgage indebtedness. The, um, the mortgage crisis recently is a nice example of these coming together. In other words, you can actually, in capitalism, and Weber thinks this is very important, you can sell claims to future revenue streams. That's what a state bond is. You are giving the state some money, and they are in turn promising not only to give you back that money at a point in time, but to pay interest, to give you a, a, an increment above and beyond what you give the state. And that is essentially a claim on the future revenue stream of the state, which it can back by the power of taxation. Weber notes that these paper representations of ownership were actually initiated by states and municipalities. They did not come first in the form of bonds, or rather stocks, in private enterprise. They initiated as state or public mechanisms for um, sort of smoothing out revenue streams. If you only collect taxes once a year, this was a way to continue to draw in revenue continuously over the course of the year, which you could eventually pay off at that moment when you collected taxes. It was a very efficient way of consolidating, amassing large amounts of money into chunks big enough to enable you to undertake various kinds of things. Big things, like raising and training and equipping an army, for example or various kinds of public works that you might want to undertake for your municipality or your state. So eventually, this morphed into um, things like the East India Company, state-backed commercial enterprises in which private capital was brought into large enough pieces <coughs> to undertake large-scale commercial endeavors. For Weber, this is sort of a description of the historical preconditions necessary to the emergence of capitalism. One of the things he says in the selection that I asked you to read was that you can't have this without also having speculation. And I mentioned this at the end of the last lecture. That speculation is an unavoidable characteristic of capitalism made unavoidable by the very paper representations that are necessary to make the system work. And here the key thing is not so much that ownership or productive capacity is represented in paper or owned through the ownership of paper. The key thing is that those shares, those pieces of paper can themselves be bought and sold. So that even if the factory that they represent sits there and doesn't change, who owns that factory can change. And in fact, how much that factory is worth can change because that factory's worth is measured by the sum total of the value of the pieces of paper that represent that factory. And that is a separate market. It's a stock market, for example. And people can buy and share their pieces of ownership in that factory based on their predictions or estimates of how much money that factory is making now and how much money that factory might make over time in the future. If there's a boom going on in a certain product, a factory that makes that product is going to get more valuable, and that's going to express itself through rising value in those pieces of paper, even if the factory itself remains utterly unchanged. So this, Weber says, generates recurrent crises. Crisis is endemic to this form of organization of the economy. And it's, it comes in two forms, this speculative tendency. It can come in both an irrational form, which we are all painfully familiar with from the past couple of years, right here. These are bubbles. These are situations in which people start paying more and more for those shares of that factory just because everyone else is buying them and getting excited about them and is willing to pay more and more for them. The price is going up, and it seems like, why not buy more, even if the price is getting pretty high? Because it seems like it's just going to keep going up. And you can buy it right now and wait a month, and it'll go up and sell it, and you'll have made a profit, and you'll be out of that market at that point. You will have just made your profit and walked away. And if everybody starts thinking this way, you get this positive feedback, this irrational exuberance, as Alan Greenspan called it famously, what was that now, five years ago? And those are the kinds of bubbles that can collapse simply because they are irrational. But Weber is careful to point out that there are also perfectly rational crises of speculation. You can get a case in which it's actually the case that there is a growing demand for a product. And everybody who's interested in possibly taking advantage of that growing demand makes a decision to invest in new factories to build that thing. But if everybody does it, the number of factories that get built will in fact exceed the growing demand for the product. And you will find yourselves, after a period of time, with too much of that thing, more of that thing than there is demand for, even though demand has increased. And this is a, essentially not so much a bubble. It's simply rational decision making at the individual level, which has the collective effect of resulting in overproduction and collapsing prices. And Weber, as we discussed, suggests that this is a really radical change in the organization of the economy, precisely because these crises are now essentially internal to the human component of the economy and are not the result of acts of God, droughts, pest outbreaks, that kind of thing. You no longer can point somehow to nature or God and blame those quasi-divine or impersonal forces for a crisis.